So really, you know, we have to engage people in this and we have to make them want to actually be a part of this equation and get their participation. Part of our problem in, in moving towards secularity is most people neither see the, the, the importance of it nor exactly know how to do it. They're not engineers and, and actually very often it's much easier to see the, the, the complications than it is to see the uh, longer term uh, benefits and that's why I think the the political leadership and the government endorsement and sub, you know, subsidy for the right sorts of activities are, is, is, is so crucial. I think businesses have to lead. I, I, in my time working in NGOs or in business, I haven't seen the leadership that the world needs from governments. Again, I think governments in some places and sometimes are, are, are more short term than businesses. Well, it's very hard for governments, which are in a short cycle of voting and elections, four or five years, to make long-term decisions. And so what we find is that sustainability is about investing for the long term, and the pressure is all short term. And especially in a democracy, what is often very difficult is asking the public to make short-term sacrifices for a long-term gain. We love to accumulate stuff, I think. Um, it's a very human uh, condition, you know, we've, we've kind of, uh, we relate stuff back to, to our sense of self and um, our, our values, if you like, and our status in society. So to suddenly give up stuff and to access it rather than, than own it outright, it's, it's going to be quite a, quite a step for us to make. And getting that message in right is, is going to be critical going forward. And the circular economy Community hasn't really worked that out yet, I don't think. They haven't really done much work around the, the public engagement piece that's needed. We expect, even in our countries, in our economies, to always be growing. If we're not growing, it's a crisis. We expect our businesses to always be growing. So we've got a set of expectations which are actually fundamentally in conflict with the finite planet that we live on. On the one hand, humans have always been at the frontiers. They've always been expanding, conquering territories, and generally it's been a, a path of increased consumption, increased utilization of land and of energy. That's been the story of human evolution. On the other hand, it's only fairly recently that we have been so wealthy that we haven't had to think about reusing or recycling. It wasn't that long ago when, whether it was the milkman bringing milk bottles back for us to reuse or darning our socks when they had holes in them, this was, this was normal. And it was because it was too expensive to do something else. Yeah, I think one of the changes that's happened is we've lost sight of what makes us happy. You know, our fundamental human needs hasn't changed but the way that we satisfy those needs has changed. In a way, we could say rather facetiously, we invented advertising, we invented consumption, to say that you can't be happy unless you have more stuff. Whereas, of course, for thousands of years, we were happy without stuff. That's one of the elements of the take, make, waste, throw away society that we bought into. And we need to really question that. We need to teach our kids that it's not okay just to want more. It's not necessarily gonna make them happier. There is something about human psychology where we want to feel that we're growing. We have to just think about what growth means. Does growth always mean more? Or does it mean development? Does it mean we're increasing our satisfaction, that we're evolving, that we're learning more as a society, as a city, as a family? Well, I think the linear economy is, is, is the prevailing model because, because simply the world is just not in tune or, or necessarily aware of the circular uh, model and its, and its economic and societal uh, uh, benefits. So it seems to us that part of the challenge is, is uh, that uh, the circular stakeholders are, are still working in silos. So they're not all, the community isn't one community yet and the purpose 
our purpose of forming this, uh, this uh, uh, Accelerating the Circular Economy program is in fact to, to bring all these stakeholders into the space so that, they can, so that they can form partnerships that will help speed up and scale. And of course, you know, this includes uh, technology and new innovations. Uh, this includes uh, policy makers who can create regulatory frameworks that, that enable circular business models to flourish. And this, of course, uh, includes uh, investors. What needs to happen? Companies need to make uh, ma need to make these products. Uh, well, they need to make more of them, more affordable. So they, they they need to scale. These ideas need to scale and become commercially feasible um, in a way that's also affordable. They all carry a premium. And if you want circular solutions to uh, to basically take off, um, they need to be made more affordable. We could enter maybe 10 years time, we could see a circular economy that's just built for the elite. Um, and actually what happens then about access, you know, um, if, if ordinary people can't access these products, then they're, then they're not going to benefit from them. And that's, that's a real problem. If we over engineer the circular economy, we'll never get it off the drawing board, certainly not to hundreds, if not thousands of companies. So take Marks and Spencer, for example, we sell 35,000 different product lines. I mean, that's a big challenge to think circular. But if I look at it another way and say, well, 28,000 items of clothing, how do we sell clothing in a fundamentally different way? How do we ensure that customers get a great product that lasts as long as it possibly can, but when you finish with it, there is an easy way to return it to Marks and Spencer. And that's what we've done with our swapping campaign with Oxfam. Return your used M&S clothing to us or to Oxfam. We donate it to Oxfam. They reuse it, they resell it. Uh, there's 99.9% .9 of the fibre they get back is reused to great value for Oxfam and their overseas development work. That's fantastic. It's done with real scale and real authority. Now we get back three to four million items a year. That's not 100% of what we sell, it's 1%. So we, again, we're challenging ourselves to how we get that to scale. But that's still a fairly significant number, three or four million items a year. So we've got a challenge there about simplification, make it as easy as possible. The second challenge we've got is to actually get businesses working together on this, particularly comp competitors. We will not create a sustainable economy simply because Little or Marks and Spencer decides it wants to do it on its own. We need to show as many different participants in the UK and global economy are doing it. Partly because everybody's raw material is somebody else's waste, is somebody else's opportunity for, for resource as well. So the more people that are participating, the more that materials can be used. The more we can get the synergies and the efficiencies of scale collection of materials and brought, bring them back as well. So by, only by doing those two things, simplification and scaling it across many different businesses, will we create a truly circular economy. I think it really does come down to cost. There's a lot of local authorities who are doing the right thing. I think what we need is some support from the government to try and push that forward. And don't forget, it's not just householders. You've got retail organisations, you've got commercial organisations. How do we support those guys? How do we make them think more about their food waste? There's an awful lot going on. Don't get me wrong, people are really focused on it, but I think there's another push we could make to try and get another slice of that food waste out of the residual stream into plants like these. The trouble is with, with the circular economy, you can't just design um, a circular product or service in isolation. The whole system has to change with it. You know, that circular product will only go so far if you've still got a linear economic system supporting it. We can now use 30 years of plame and shame as a true innovation engine. We can reinvent all our materials to be good for biological or technical systems and we need the support of the people because if they just sit back and relax, we will be too slow. And I say, let's celebrate life. Let's welcome people to this planet. Then we could even be 20 billion people on this planet and be good for the other species as well. So it's up to us. We now have the expertise together. It's now time to act.